Professor Hearn's book on competition appears at a moment when we're watching the democracies of many nations dissolve into oligarchies, even if they retain electoral forms. We are seeing authoritarian ideas giving democratic ideas a run for their money and winning on many fronts. My country of origin is one of these. The United States continues to hold fair elections, and yet last autumn, six in 10 Republicans still believed that Joe Biden stole the 2020 presidential election and support every voter restriction their party can dream up. This is one context into which Jonathan has launched his book on competition. So the question that it raises is, is competition a force that keeps liberal democracy together while delivering economic prosperity? Or is competition the thing that sets us against each other and undermines liberal democracy with highly unequal struggles for dominance and control? Hey, Jonathan's book is a, is a passionate, as well as quite thoroughly researched, a brief for the first possibility. Competition as an engine of war, conquest, domination, tyranny, all those destructive things does get domesticated in his term and comes to constitute modern liberal democracy. For him, competition isn't outside liberalism or democracy, but within it. Domesticated competition is the way democracies manage power, in Jonathan's account, more or less successfully. Even where management fails and competition mangles the destinies of individuals, communities, or whole societies, it has become who we are. We have no choice but to confront competition rather than disavow it and come up with better and more enriching domestications. So my interpretation of this is that we must participate in using the law and institutions to manage competition according to our own vision of how society should work. So my feeling at the end of the book was that we must engage competition fully as social participants if we do not want it to run roughshod over us. If we hang back, we get monopoly and post-democracy at home and war abroad. Among the many things that impressed me about Jonathan's book, um, I'll just I'll mention a couple more here. Um, most of us were trained to read liberalism as possessive individualism, grounded in property ownership and personal rights. Jonathan breaks with this tradition by rooting liberalism in competition, competition which becomes domesticated in corporate forms. He brings us liberalism as fundamentally social, structured by rivalries and divergences among different social institutions. So liberalism thus takes its advanced form mainly from institutions that require as well as constrain collaboration. And then the second thing I'll mention is, is the book's remarkable range, its broad learning. Um, ISRF prizes interdisciplinary work and Jonathan can only be described as a shining example. In this book, he writes, I move across a wide range of historical and other literature seeking to develop a broad and synthetic account of my subject, seeking a broad understanding. He calls himself a shameless generalist and adds that whatever the hazards, I think it is necessary to get our minds around the big questions that confront us. So I definitely have. Um, ISRF loves big questions work, and this uh, book is an excellent case of it. Um, at the ISRF, we run between three and six grants programs each year for academics and for independent scholars alike. Many of our fellows work on a theory that I think of as post-individualism, meaning that they foreground institutions, social relations, and ties that bind us. This work revises, often rejects, in order to transform the political philosophy that has long made social rights secondary to our rights as individuals. The COVID-19 pandemic made this work even more urgent. We, we all suffered from the loss of social relations we also saw the political cultures most devoted to liberal individualism, those of the United Kingdom and the United States, run up world-beating terrible records of COVID infection rates and death. We also saw rules about vaccination and mask wearing denounced as grave threats to civil liberty. So many ISRF fellows have been reframing these discussions. To go back to our first launches, Annalyn de Dang argued in her book on the history of freedom that the only truly valuable form is democratic freedom and not the negative individualist kind. Um, in his book, An African Path to Disability Justice, 
Oce Onazi redefined disability justice through Ubuntu, a relational, not individualist notion of personhood, one that also does not require, in Oce's reading, symmetrical capabilities among persons. In his book, Victory, Kean O'Driscoll argued that if just war even exists, it must emerge from a collective decision process that bears in mind a nation or a group's relations to the appointed enemy. And we've launched two books written or edited by another fellow, Kimberly Brownlee, who makes a powerful case for the philosophical priority of social rights over individual ones. Jonathan points towards a harmony between the collaborative domestication of competitive individual agency and the freedom of that agency. So I'm, I'm particularly happy that the foundation is helping to support this whole line of investigation that Jonathan is an, an exemplar of that. So as um, we've discussed beforehand, I'm going to turn this over to Jonathan for about 15 minutes to give an overview of the book, and then we will hear from each of our two respondents for five or seven minutes or so um, each, although we display normally you know, this flexibility in the timing of this, and then we'll turn it over to you. I'll give a brief bio of each of them uh, immediately before they speak. So on to Jonathan. He is a professor of political and historical sociology in the School of Social and Political Science. He took his undergraduate degree in social studies from Bard College. I meant to read columns. Little Art Solidarity. <laughs> um, and then trained as an anthropologist, earning a PhD in cultural anthropology from the City University of New York. This may help explain why his work can be described as historically and ethnographically informed sociological theory. He began teaching politics and social, uh, sociology at Edinburgh in 1998 and has concentrated on sociology since 2001. His interdisciplinary work focuses on theories of power, nationalism, and national identity, the nature of liberal society, social evolution and change, Scottish society and politics, the banking crisis in Scotland, among other topics. He has long-term interest in how we conceptualize and theorize power and its role in society and in associated long-term patterns of historical and social change. His research has been supported by the Venner Grant Foundation and the Lieberhume Trust, as well as by ISRF. He is the author of many articles as well as three other books, Theorizing Power, 2012, Rethinking Nationalism, 2006, and Claiming Scotland from 2000. And he is also a musician, probably most fundamentally, writing and performing in his spare time. So Jonathan, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Please join me in welcoming. First thing to say is thank you to the ISRF for originally funding the research that eventually led to this book after several years, uh, and for hosting this launch, and for buying many of you a book. <laughs> uh, thanks for that, and I want to say thanks to Timo and Lindsay for um, being here and, and, and responding. Uh, that's what it's all about. Um, I thought I'd do, I have about 15 minutes, I'm going to try and not waffle too much, uh, but I thought I'd try and do three things. One is just say a bit about this term, the title of the book, Domestication of Competition, what's, what's the idea there? Uh, then I'll say a little bit about some of the core claims that I'm trying to advance in the book. There's all sorts of theoretical arguments behind them that I can't you know, do justice to, so I will just offer them as blunt assertions. Uh, and then I'll say a little bit about, about how I come to this topic. Um, so the first point about the domestication of competition, um, by that term I mean the sort of institutionalization, routinization of competition, uh, largely through, in a certain period, the late 18th, early 19th century, through the extension of law and the creation of legally constituted corporate entities, like companies, but also political parties, uh, various kinds of groups that you find in civil society, associations, charities, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm interested in how, at a certain period, those uh, new forms of corporate agency appear as kind of vessels for the agency of individuals pursuing their own aims. And I see it as a very distinctive kind of shift that happens at that point. Um, Max Weber, in one of his writings, refers to competition as peaceful conflict. And that kind of partly captures what I'm getting at. I'm, I'm interested in how 
human society, which is always involves conflict, always involves rivalry over limited goods, over resources, uh, at a certain point develops this highly institutionalized, you know, designed ways of managing competition and, and trying to channel it down constructive paths. So there's a kind of implicit contrast there with some notion of wild competition, uh, you know, feudal lords uh, constantly fighting with each other and, and bugging each other off. That's not domesticated competition. That's, that's old-fashioned, undomesticated competition. And I'm interested in how we come into a world where uh, we do a lot of it the other way around. And there's also uh, a, a quite explicit sort of analogy going on here in this title, um, the, which is to uh, biological domestication of plants and animals by human beings. Around 10, 12,000 years ago, human beings started to domesticate other, <laughs> other species to our own advantage uh, very intensively over time, and uh, we, we intervened in, this, in the biological evolution of other species in a way that fundamentally changed the scale and, and potential of human societies. Until we started doing that, we were just foragers in very small groups, and before long we were living in cities. So, uh, so I'm interested in saying, okay, at one point, this one major juncture called the Neolithic Revolution, uh, uh, that period of domestication of the biological world had huge consequences for human social organization. At this later stage that I'm talking about, 18th, 19th century, this, uh, we in effect uh, intervene in the evolution of society itself. We domesticate ourselves, through our, which is you know, the reference to human chess pieces on the cover of the book, so it's kind of alluding to that. We domesticate ourselves uh, by intervening in competitive processes that have always been there, you know, warfare and rivalry and palace intrigues and all sorts of things, that we shift to a new way of organizing that where we are deliberately setting up the institutions that will do the competing and trying to set certain parameters for that. So that's kind of the, 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 you know, the hook of the book, as it were. Um, the kind of core claims that I was just going to, three of them I'm going to sort of hit on. One is, as, as Chris has said, uh, the argument is this, is this is a new way of managing power relations in society, but it's also at the same time as providing a way of simply managing competing claims on social goods and allocating them, it's also legitimating that way of managing uh, power relations so that uh, rather than we now live in the world, or rather than say, why is this person entitled to this power, to this rule, to these resources? Well, it's because God wants them to have it or they were born into the group that has the right to inherit it, uh, as in most aristocratic societies. We move into a form of society where the answer to that question is because they want it in a fair competition. Okay? Um, I'm not saying that all competitions are fair by a long shot, but that's what changed historically. Um, and another point I'm trying to make is that uh, this change spans various various institutional spheres of society. So on the one hand, uh, in a sort of contrary to the main thread of the argument, military competition becomes very unified and controlled under the modern state rather than fragmentary and controlled by various lords, you know, in constant rival with each other. Um, but uh, economic competition, uh, political competition, uh, uh, competition in the realm of ideas and ideology and claims on truth, these things are all uh, subject to this process of institutionalization in the same period. And so I'm sort of uh, uh, disagreeing with a kind of Marxian economic determinism, which tends to talk as though uh, the capitalist economy rises up, it is hyper-competitive, and it forces everybody to be competitive in all these other spheres. The competition radiates out from capitalism part of a sort of critique of capitalism, you get versions of this in a lot of current critiques of neoliberalism. I'm saying, no, there's something globally that happens in this historical thread of society that starts in Europe and, and continues in central societies, especially in the United States, that uh, causes all these things to transform at the same time, precisely because that older aristocratic, religiously validated order has come under such strain that it no longer can do the work of validating and legitimating society. Um, 
So I'm, I'm pushing back against kind of economic determinism. And then thirdly, uh, I've, one of my aims for the book is that uh, often when you study uh, the raise the question of liberalism or liberal society, there's something funny that happens because we often act as though liberalism is just a philosophy, and if it explains society, somehow John Stuart Mill and a bunch of people had a bunch of great ideas and this somehow got fed back on society and made it liberal. And I'm trying to argue in a much more kind of historical way that you no, know, actually a lot of these institutions changed and liberal philosophy, liberal theory, liberal accounts of the kind of society we live in um, develop in a dialectic with that uh, in trying to understand that kind of society. So they're not... Uh, um, I'm trying to look at the kind of society we live in the same way Mark Bloch would have looked at feudal society, not making the case for feudal society or against feudal society, but saying uh, this is how it worked <laughs> and this is how it developed. And I'm trying to say, even though I myself am a kind of liberal um, and, and have certain commitments to a liberal form of society, I think to, to know what we mean by our normative philosophical arguments that we want to make, we, are, we need to separately build the analytic empirical argument about how that kind of society took shape. Um, now let me just say a couple of words about how I got here. I took a taxi. No. Uh, the, uh, my first PhD research was on Scottish nationalism. Sorry, I'm probably doing this. My first PhD research was on Scottish nationalism. And uh, it was about uh, the devolution uh, movement in the early 90s, the kind of complex array of social actors interested in, in uh, more autonomous uh, politics in Scotland. And I was interested in Scot the Scottish case of nationalism precisely because uh, its language, its, its procedures, its way of uh, advancing its cause was largely civic and liberal, and constantly alluding to things like you know, the democratic intellect or whatever, constantly drawing on image, liberal imagery to make its case. And the, of course, ethnicity and culture are never absent, they're there at the background. They were remarkably sort of downplayed, and that got me interested in uh, how liberalism can also be part of the cultural language of society, not simply the sort of abstract philosophy. Um, and from that, I kind of developed sort of nagging questions about how liberal societies in general work. The curious thing about liberal societies uh, as a way, in, and I think of societies as ways of organizing power, <laughs> one of my kind of under, underpinning assumptions, is that this is a form of society that is premised on the idea that uh, we distrust centralized authority. You know. Uh, Isaiah Berlin's you know, famous negative liberty idea, the idea that you know, what we want is just to be left alone, to not be bothered by the state, to have our own, uh, you know, we don't like anybody having power over us. That's kind of, you know, don't tread on me. That's kind of the, in the DNA of this form of society. And yet, what it has generated is some of the most powerful states <laughs> and societies in the world, right? It doesn't, it speaks with forked tongue, as we said, you know. Um, so I'm always interested in how, how do you validate power relations in a society that thinks power relations should not be validated, right? There's a, there's a deep paradox at the heart of this liberal form of society. And that has kind of uh, gnawed at my mind and, and caused me to think about these things. Uh, um, and I guess the other point I would make, and before I hand on to Timo, is just that uh, it also, uh, in my thinking about the nature of power and how it works, particularly in liberal forms of society, has uh, led me to the view that uh, when people suggest that uh, the form of society we live in is uh, beyond repair, hopeless, we need revolution, we need total transformation uh, to set things right, a kind of classic radical revolutionary position. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a boring, uh, graduate reformist, right? Uh, liberal, and uh, but I, I don't trust people when they start speaking like that. <laughs> My idea of what it means to critique the society we're in is to be able to say uh, 
these aspects of it are good, <laughs> and we want to preserve and build on those aspects are bad, and we want to weed them out. We want to intervene in how it evolves forward as best we can for our limited knowledge. And uh, anyone who tells you that, no, as long as we destroy this thing, what comes next will be better, is selling you snake oil. Um, and that's why this kind of approach of thinking about the society is important. It's a way of providing a foundation saying, look, this isn't just an idea that John Stuart Mill and a bunch of people had and imposed on us, or Adam Smith made us live like this. This is something that evolved for very powerful, deeply rooted reasons, and we have to find our ways to work with it. As I like to say, I'll close with this, you know, if you met a, a jazz critic who said, you know, you know, I'm the world's greatest jazz critic, um, and you say, oh, really? And uh, tell me, what do you think about jazz? Like, it's all terrible. <laughs> um, uh, we should get rid of it. You know, I'm, the, I'm a real jazz critic. Not one of those, you know, uh, amateur jazz critics who say, I like this bit, but I don't like that bit. You know, he's a great saxophonist. He's lousy. Um, to be a critic is precisely to make these distinctions between the good and the bad, not to damn the whole thing. People who damn the whole thing and put critic or critical in advance of what they're doing are not being honest with themselves. So that's the kind of uh, final touch, and I will uh, pass on to you. Wait, how's that? Thank you. That was, that was really quite helpful. Um, our, our first respondent is Timo Juden, who is a professor of philosophy at the University of Essex and who had taught at UCD in Dublin and in Groningen in the Netherlands before joining the faculty at Essex as a lecturer in moral and political philosophy in 2011. He originally studied politics and, and Hebrew at SOAS and at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He became particularly interested in the philosophical foundations of politics and society and completed an MA in social and political thought and a PhD in philosophy at Sussex, writing his doctoral dissertation on Adorno's critique of Kant's practical philosophy. His research covers a number of areas. He reminds me a bit of Jonathan Hearn. <laughs> uh, the moral status of capitalism and markets, competition and competitiveness, esteem and solidarity, the Frankfurt School critical theory, including its major figures analysis, analyses of key concepts like markets, recognition, reification, hope, and freedom and determinism, and also feminist theory, including a paper on sexual objectification in the journal Ethics. Timo is a member of the Human Rights Center from 2015 to 21. He was a researcher on the ESRC-funded Human Rights Big Data and Technology Project, where he contributed to a work stream on consent in 2014, he was co-investigator on an AHRC follow-on fund for impact and engagement grant called Achieving UNCRPD Compliance under the auspices of the Essex Autonomy Project. There's a lot of acronyms in there. Tell me if I messed them up. At Essex, he is the principal investigator of the Competition and Competitiveness Project funded by Leverhulme Research Leadership Award. Timo, thanks for being with us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks both, both to the ISF and, and, and to Joseph for inviting me uh, to join and, and this wonderful book launch. Uh, I had thought I had more time, so I've written a lot more, so I'm trying to get to it a bit quicker. I just want to start very quickly, so by uh, saying that there's a certain danger for me in participating in a panel like this, because different disciplines have different cultures, and the culture of philosophy is basically that if you want to really kind of say that you like something, you try to find fault with it. And if you really want to respect someone, you tell them they're wrong. Uh, I am trying to avoid this today, but just in case I'll sneak back into it, I just wanted to say how much uh, I admire this book that we are talking about today, and in particular how much I've learned from it. And I will say the least about the chapters that I've learned the most from, which are the chapters that make up part two of the book. And that's just because those are topics that I just don't know enough about to talk about uh, with any kind of authority. What I want to do instead is just focusing on two things. Uh, and one of them is the relationship between competition and power, and the other one is the relationship between competition and games. Uh, and both of them will kind of end in a kind of broad type of question, which I hope 
will invite you to say something in response if all goes well. So, so the first thing uh, to say is that at the very beginning of, of the book, Jonathan rejects reductive biological explanations of competitiveness. But the reasons for competing are so varied, he says, that it makes little sense to conceive competition as rooted in some instinct, psycho psychological drive or disposition. However, this does not mean that competition is not based in any human need, want, or desire. And indeed, when he discusses what he calls the more fundamental assumptions about society, history, and social change that explain how he conceptualizes and theorizes competition, uh, one of his basic premises is that the human need for power is uh, the most basic thing shaping human society. That's a quote from the book. And two further premises are that power is distributed among social actors and that their pursuit of power drives the social change. And on the basis of this understanding of power, in part two of the book, Jonathan then reconstructs how structural changes concerning the military, the corporation, political parties, churches, and universities collectively domesticate competition and make competition a central mechanism through which power is distributed, pursued, and importantly, <coughs> legitimized in modern society. So the first thing to note about those premises, which I think are not implausible, is that in most cases that interest us here, power is a position of good. And that is to say, in social and political context, it doesn't matter only how much power I have, but how much power I have compared to or relative to others. If I have less power, and that's also true for power too, I think, not just for power over, if I have less power, too, than others, I may have reasons to increase it. And this is, tr this is true for everyone. The human need for power will lead to widespread competitiveness, even if competitiveness itself is neither an instinct nor a psychological drive or disposition. And I think this explains why competition is a pervasive feature of modern societies, including uh, pre-modern and early modern societies of the kind studied by sociologists that Jonathan discusses, such as Max Weber, uh, Georg Simmel, uh, Norbert Elias, and so on. And I think Johnson quite rightly kind of puts himself in this tradition of sociologists who, studies, who study, as it were, a channel theory of competition through a form of historical sociology. In such terms. So, and as Johnson rightly points out, competition is often driven by situations of scarcity, that is, situations in which people compete over limited resources or opportunities, and in which there's not enough for everyone. In those situations, having power enables one to secure those resources or opportunities. But people also seek power as an end in itself, and it is less clear what the purpose of this is. Um, so here, I think it may be helpful to complement the power theoretical perspective of this book with the recognition theoretical perspective. This is what I want to ask you about. So according to this perspective, people ultimately don't seek power, but they seek social recognition. Rather, uh, and, and they compete for different forms of social recognition, such as admiration or esteem. And like power, admiration and esteem can be positional goods, which means that their value, the value of being admired or esteemed, may depend on how admired or esteemed other people are. Also, this is not necessarily the case. But when it is the case, admiration and esteem become scarce goods, and in those situations, people do compete for them. So this, this perspective has significant explanatory power, which I think complements the account of the book quite well. For example, it explains some of the important social changes during the transition from the pre-modern to the modern recognition order, in terms of changes to what could be admired or esteemed, say, one's status as a nobleman versus one's status as a successful businessman. Um, but where it excels most, I think, is in explaining how different social institutions, including the ones that you study, the military, the corporation, parties, churches, universities, and so on, of course, harness people's desire for social recognition and motivates them to compete in how to make themselves useful in rapidly changing societies. I just want to very briefly say that it's very funny when you work on recognition, you read other people's books, and all those metaphors that you think you found yourself, everyone else is using. So I, love, I just love this harnessing metaphor, even though I've never connect, connected with this domestication. I also have a lot of things that I've written years ago about wild competition. And then I'm reading your book and I'm finding all of these phrases again. So, so somehow, somehow we all think together about those, in, in the same way about those things. But anyway, that's just a side comment. The main point here is that since admiration and esteem cannot compel it in the way in which recognition of power can be compelled, 
I wonder whether the need for recognition doesn't have a particularly important interesting role to play in the domestication of, of competition, because it forces people to compete in ways that enables them to gain freely given recognition. So that's kind of one of my questions. The second question is about competition and games. So I was very interested in the ways in which uh, you articulate the relationship between competitive games and other forms of competition in the final chapter of the book. So I'm assuming, oh, of course, normally you say in the situation, assuming that you've read the book, <laughs> you will know, but maybe not everyone has, has read the book yet. Um, so games in this understanding are rituals that suffuse our competitive culture. But the image of the game, this is a quote, the image of the game encodes all sorts of normative standards of fairness, good conduct, and proper order that are internal to the practice of games. And if society as a whole is like a game, then so standards tend to follow. However, as Jonathan is quick to point out, life as a whole can clearly not be like a game. And in particular, people in modern societies do not compete on a, on a level playing field. So really existing social competition comes in many forms, from highly regulated games to wild competition, red and tooth and claw, uh, and a lot in between. And while the image of the game can supply norms and values to regulate for some forms of competition, it clearly cannot regulate all of them, because some forms of competition, in fact, are governed by different norms and values. Now, this claim, of course, presupposes something that you never really get, which is agreement on what norms and values governing competition, the competitive games are. And as one might expect, there is no such agreement. But according to one account, which is quite influential in the philosophy of sport, which I quite like, Competition is, is a mutually acceptable quest for excellence through challenge, right? So we challenge each other, and the outcome of it is excellence in some way. On this view, competitors of course challenges for each other, and the competitors who excel at overcoming the challenges by their opponents win the game. This conception of competition has a number of implications uh, that explain why competition can be desirable for, for, as a form of social interaction. For example, it encourages excellence, it provides benefits for all competitors, not only for winners. And as an ongoing process, it offers competitors multiple opportunities to excel. However, while it is clear that this, competition of, that this conception of competition is operative in some social competition, it's clearly not operative in all competition. So as it might be found in sports, and I think we might find it in education, and maybe in the arts and sciences. And maybe we also find it in ideological competition, and if we're very optimistic or perhaps naive, maybe we also find it in political competition. But we're not going to find it in, in, I think in reality we probably won't find it in political competition, and we also won't find it in economic competition. So corporations and parties mostly just seek power, right? And whether it's market power or political power, that power is only contingently related to excellence. So this is an important point, I think, because we wouldn't expect market competition or political competition to observe the norms and values of a competitive game. It's not that they're going wrong when they don't observe those norms and values, they're just not that sort of competition. But this means that the image of the game and the normative prescriptions that are implied in it, including the level playing field, fair play, those kinds of terms, are not going to give us enough guidance, I think, to assess the morality of competition in those areas. And so I think you might agree with this, but then the question that arises for both of us is what other moral and or ethical criteria are there that we can use? And I think this question is particularly important where competition is clearly seen to be unfair. And yet it is difficult to conceive of alternative selection mechanisms. This might be said to be the case in education, uh, or in the job market, or in similar areas where equality of opportunity is difficult or, 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 or maybe even impossible to achieve, but at some point, selection must be made. So the question, in a way, is whether the problems in this area point to the limits of competition as a legitimizing mechanism. And I, I was wondering what you thought about this problem, because I know that this is something that you grabbed with in the book. And I think I'll leave it at that. Do you have other? No, no, this okay. is All right. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Our second commentator, you're okay with? with yeah, yeah. Is uh, Lindsay Patterson.
He is a professor emeritus of education policy in the School of Social and Political Science at Edinburgh University. <laughs> we have another case of major intellectual diversity on our hands. He took his first degree at Aberdeen University where he studied mainly mathematics and English literature. He then did a PhD in statistics at Edinburgh University and worked as a postdoctoral statistician for the Agricultural Research Council, after which he was a lecturer in the Department of Actuarial Mathematics and Statistics at Harriet Watt University, where his research focused on epidemiological work in medicine. His current research areas include secondary education in the second half of the 20th century, the historical context of educational change in, um, in that same part of the 20th century, the effects of education on people's civic values, and educational expansion and social mobility. He has contributed to debates in Scotland since the early 1990s on the impact of education policies and on the importance of policy implementation in achieving or modifying the aims of policymakers. He has published in a wide range of leading academic journals, including all the education journals you can think of and many that you can't. He has recently held a Lever Hume Major Research Fellowship for a project called Education and Society in Scotland, in which he is using Scotland's unique series of surveys of school students between the 1950s and the 1990s to investigate the social impact of education policy in the second half of the 20th century. Lindsay, it's a pleasure having you. That introduction. Thank you, John, for inviting me to contribute here and, and to, to uh, forward to the discussion after this. Um, I'm going to concentrate on John's discussion of education because I think that his illuminating analysis of competition over knowledge claims reveals both the unavoidability of competition for human intellectual progress and yet also the fundamental incompatibility of competition with equal human worth. In short, if competition is as fundamental to human progress as Jonathan says, and he convinces me that it is, then progress can never be consistent with equality of achievement, equality of power, or equality of respect and recognition. Although concentrating on education, I'll briefly draw out in passing some implications as I see them for competition in the economy and comp competition in democratic deliberations too of Jonathan's other areas of expertise. I should say in passing here but that one of the most astonishing things about this remarkable book is the, the extent of the scholarship that was behind it. I can't even begin to comment on the chapter about military competition because I am utterly ignorant of that. I claim a modicum of knowledge of the other areas. Jonathan's erudition here is quite astonishing. First of all, a preliminary comment in terminology and equivalence of the term selection and competition. Jonathan draws a distinction in the context of Darwinian natural selections. He says this, while conflict and competition may lead to selection, the increase or decrease in frequency of certain social traits, institutions and practices, natural selection can also happen without such confrontation, by which he means mainly random variation. But then, correctly in my view, he says that not the, this non-deliberate natural selection is absent in social selection. He quotes Michael Mann saying, in actual life it is always some volitional centre which sets thought going. Now, no doubt we could debate at length whether there is, in fact, in human social life, a random variation out of which the best ideas are selected, and perhaps the vastness of the internet makes this more likely. But in practice, the selection of ideas is overwhelmingly through deliberately brought about competition of ideas. Jonathan gives the paradigm as the emergence of the concept of natural science, the supreme theorist for which is popular. Scientific progress is explicitly based on the competition of rightful ideas and humans have spent the last four centuries refining methods by which that can be done. I agree with Jonathan on that, and also with him on the further point that all intellectual progress is now modelled on scientific methods, sometimes explicitly but mostly not. I don't just mean selection by non-scientific versions of scientific method, which is fundamentally statistical, even the selection of ideas in a field that is not amenable to statistical decisions, such as philosophy or aesthetics, is based on competitive success. So on this terminological introductory point, competition between ideas has enabled us to select better ideas. But there's the rub. Competition among ideas always, in practice, entails competition among people. Selection of ideas always, in practice, entails selection of people for social roles. 
Consider again the paradigmatic example of the competition of scientific ideas. Now, Jonathan says the way in which scientific ideas are brought into competition with each other is through such things as the prior competitive winning of research grants or the comp competitive winning of other kinds of institutional support such as a tenured academic position, academic promotion, the competitive attracting of colleagues working on similar projects, the competitive selection of excellent research students and so on. Ideas don't fight it out, as it were, in a kind of platonic philosophical plane. They fight it out because human beings fight for or against them. Now, Jonathan, of course, does acknowledge this. He says, competition over hard-won ideas can never be fully disarticulated from the competition to carve out career paths and professional identities. But his emphasis is on the competition of ideas as the basis of testing truth claims. What I'm suggesting here is that for ideas to compete, there have to be people to enter them into the competition, and then the people who associated themselves with the successful ideas become socially successful people with all the games and status that that entails. Moreover, it, that success also brings gains in wealth and power and the recognition, which is how I think this human embedding of the competition of ideas has an impact also on these two other fields that Jonathan talks about, the, the economy and democracy. The people who sponsor the ideas that win the competition of ideas can earn more and in some technological fields even come to steer important aspects of the economy. The people who sponsor the ideas that win the competition of ideas about society acquire power because they dominate what is talked about, Stephen Luke's third dimension of power. So social progress of all sorts of kinds, because it depends on this competition of ideas, is inseparable from competition among people and from selection of people for social roles. Moreover, if that is somewhat controversial, the human questions become even more difficult if we now follow the education pipeline back to undergraduate selection, to secondary school selection, and perhaps even further. For society to find the intellectual leaders who will produce the ideas that will fight it out in the ways that Jonathan explains, there has to be a process of sorting and sifting in the progression from infancy to adulthood. And this sorting and sifting has to happen all the time so that society doesn't run out of intellectual leaders who can sponsor the competitive ideas and so on. Put this differently, without competition and selection of people, there would not be the possibility ever of finding and selecting the best ideas. At any given moment in time, it is possible to imagine an education system that is not based on competition and selection. But in the absence of that, over the time, a long time, the culture would atrophy. Now, of course, this conclusion that selecting ideas entails selecting people is, to put it mildly, not popular. It has not been popular in academic circles since the 1920s and in policy circles in the West since the 1960s. One reason is that educational competition and selection are incompatible with equal di dignity and equal citizenship, and that is in turn inconsistent with democracy. There have been broadly three kinds of attempts to reconcile democracy with this unavoidability of human selection in the interests of intellectual selection. Each of these three is highly complex, and so my very brief summaries of them are too stark to do adequate justice to the complexity of each of the arguments. The first one is, is dominant now in educational thinking, and it denies the necessity to select ideas on universalistic grounds. In other words, this argument is essentially this. If we refuse to select people, and if selecting ideas implies selecting people, then we have to refuse to select ideas. We can call this the relativistic response. The most popular version of that at the moment is decolonizing the curriculum. But it also includes such current policy debates as the aim for vocational education to be of equal status to the academic curriculum, or for the same status at secondary schools to be attached to easy subjects as to difficult ones. If there are no universalistic criteria by which to select ideas or cultures, then equal attention ought to be given to all ideas and all cultures. And ideas earn a place in the curriculum on the ground solely of authentic representation, which ground is that the ideas simply exist. So this first approach to the controversy of educational competition avoids human selection by including, in principle, all ideas that have ever been thought. The academic grandfather of this approach is Pierre Bourget for whom any claims to a universal culture is no more than the assertion of the dominant culture at any particular historical moment. An illusion, as he calls it, an arbitrary imposition, which is moreover a malevolent deceit because its imposition imposes also what he calls an ignorance of its arbitrariness. 
Famously then, Bourdieu describes this as symbolic violence, which is actually another way of saying that competition among ideas is inseparable from a competition among people. In that competition, he believes the outcome is explained not by any universal criteria, but by inequalities of power. The second response to the inevitability of educational competition is simpler and might be described as the classically liberal one. This simply accepts that selection of ideas is inseparable from the selection of people. So if we want intellectual progress, we just have to accept the human competition that is the necessary basis of intellectual competition, even if the result is gross differences of human status, power and well-being. Officially, as it were, this harsh view is no longer tolerated, and no doubt all of us here would be reluctant to admit tolerating its harshness, we'd probably call it neoliberal. Yet we actually engage in it and encourage it all the time. Every time we assess a student, every time we appoint a new colleague or judge a colleague for promotion, every time we review a paper or a grant application or a book proposal, we are not just judging the competition among ideas, we are contributing to judging the competition among people. We do this as a matter of what John Hall calls moderated hypocrisy, pretending that we are operating according to a value system that is not so harshly selective of people. And we try to maintain that hypocrisy by claiming that the selection of ideas can be separated from the selection of people, even though it can't. Then the final democratic response to the inseparability of competition among people and competition among ideas is the utopian hope that we can avoid it. This was the original educational promise of social liberalism and the due course of social democracy, and it is now deeply unfashionable. It has been called various terms in different languages, but in English, liberal education, that's extended to all the English-speaking countries, including many of the former British colonies, notably, in fact, India. It was summed up famously by Matthew Arnold as getting to know, on all the matters which concern us most, the best which has been thought and said in the world, and through this knowledge, turning a stream of fresh and free thought upon our stock notions and habits. The last part of that comment from Arnold shows his awareness of the unavoidability of competition of ideas, challenging stock notions with fresh ideas. The view that competition of ideas could be consistent with social democracy was maintained by all the political leaders of radical educational thought up to about the third quarter of the 20th century. Here, for example, uh, is an example from Douglas Cole, G.D.H. Cole, who was a leading socialist intellectual in Britain in the middle of the 20th century and highly influential on Labour Party thinking about what education needed to do to prepare adults to live in a democracy. Cole said in 1935 that the only duty of the teacher, the, the only duty the teacher owes to the university are the duties to think hard, to think freely and to think independently. Students must, he said, have their minds turned upside down by continuing questioning. These ideas about the value of competition among ideas were at the heart of the post-war Labour government in the UK, the high point of British social democracy, you could say, notably in the thinking of Ellen Wilkinson, who was the Minister of Education there. Wilkinson was strongly left-wing and feminist, unlike the later political left, but unlike the later political left of the 1960s and after, she did not hesitate to distinguish between the selection of the best ideas and the possibility and necessity of exposing a much wider range of children to them. So on the one hand, she said this at the founding of UNESCO, we are trying to build up out of poverty and misery the sense that there are such things as standards, that there is a difference between right and wrong, that intellectual needs are not luxuries. Unless we can put standards and values in the minds of youth, we cannot have a great civilization or a great country. On the other hand, while thus extolling the value of intellectual competition and intellectual selection, Wilkinson also could say that it would be iniquitous to steer any segment of young people away from liberal education. Even for students whom capitalism for the time being destined to lives of unrewarding labour, she believed that the best ideas could provide personal fulfilment. She said this, can't their three precious years of secondary school be at least a relief from all that? Can't Shakespeare mean more than a scrubbing brush? Can't enough of a foreign language be taught to open windows of the world? But this third utopian response was ultimately tragic because its search for a competition of ideas that would not also be a competition among people was doomed by their inseparability. 
Out of that tragic failure inevitably came on the political left the first response, abjuring all universal ideas by which to judge the competition among the ideas, because the liberal sympathy for human failure outweighed any abstract sympathy for universal criteria. So let me sum up in conclusion what I've been arguing in response to this astonishing book. The competition among ideas is inseparable in practice from competition among the carriers of ideas. The selection of ideas entails the selection of the people who best express these ideas. This equivalence creates then a permanent ethical dilemma. For intellectual progress, we cannot avoid human selection. And so if human sympathy that abhors human selection of any kind prevails, as it understandably may well do, then by stultifying thereby the competition among ideas, we are gradu gradually stultifying also the human basis of intellectual progress. Thank you. Uh, thanks, guys, for, for just engaging so deeply with what I've done, what I've written. Um, and I can, I mean, there's an awful lot in there, and I'll just try and make some responses uh, and just kind of take things in order. Um, the, the question about recognition that Timo was talking about, I mean, I, uh, um, I, as you would expect, I, I, I warmly recognize the, the mission that recognition can, uh, and, and admiration and esteem can be an object of competition that you want to point towards. Isn't there something beyond power struggle that is just this basic human recognition of, of each other? Um, and I, I want to say yes, of course. And there's some parts of early in the book where I, uh, I actually ground some of the stuff in kind of climatology and, and things about human nature and you know, the fact that as language using creatures, we're different from all the other primates and that we uh, recognize that we have other minds, you know, that, that, we, that we have, recognize is, is the key term there, that, we, uh, that there's a platform for the whole possibility of human development and competition that involves this recognition of the individuality and, uh, and uh, existence of, as I say, other minds, to use a philosophical term. Um, and I mean, I do, I see that as a, you know, like I say, a sort of platform, but um, uh, you know, something that runs alongside the question of how power works and how it, how it, uh, um, uh, how people organize their activity for it, as opposed to um, something that's in competition <laughs> with with a power explanation. I mean, the other thing to bear in mind is that you know, when I talk about power, I don't mean uh, you know, power is not a bad thing, and I, I know you understand this. That you know, you know, we we're able to achieve achieve great things as human beings precisely because we act collectively and and organize ourselves in such ways that we can achieve things and collect create collective power that we would not have if we were just you know uh, individuals, and that's that's very important. So I, I uh, the stuff I'm saying about power is not um, a, what am I trying to say? The domesticated competition and the way it sorts out power is is not uh, just not red in tooth and claw. It's not like red in tooth and claw on a higher uh, plane of, of distance. It's actually uh, you know we are doing each other good by cultivating power through our um, competitions. So I think. Well, let me, I'm, I'm going to come, come back to that in a second and how I respond to, to, to uh, Lindsay. Um, there was another one where you said companies, you know, parties, you know, they're different. They're not, they're not pursuing excellence. It's not like education and science and other things uh, that uh, are sports. There's, uh, and A, I'm not, sh I'm not sure that business people and politicians would agree with you. <laughs> Certainly a lot of business people would say, that's the whole point. The competition makes us, forces us to be more excellent. Um, and you, you say, uh, what about situations where the outcomes are clearly seen to be unfair? Because you're quite right, I'm saying that this image of the game and, and rule governed domesticated competition uh, always falls short of the actual 
universe of competitive, you know, power struggles, right? It's, 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 it, 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 it never pretty catches up with it. And you say, you know, talk, you talk about this kind of review where things clearly seem to be unfair. And my response would be, how do you know they're unfair? Right? Because the, that, that critical comment, you know, it's clearly unfair, implies that you're applying the rules of the game and measuring what they're doing against it. Right? Um, so I, I, mean, I think that's, if, if I had a chance to think deeply about what you said, this guy's a philosopher, I'm just a sociologist, um, uh, you know, I would probably be trying to work, you know, get a little, uh, some question about, uh, yes, the game metaphor applies better in some cases than others and some activities than others, but when we're unhappy with things, we generally resort to a language of the game. I, what struck me, you know, when, when uh, Boris Johnson was going to all sorts of parties while the rest of us were locked down with COVID, what was the public cry against that? It's one rule for them and another rule for us. Just automatically, the language of critique is the language of the game isn't fair, right? And I'm saying the more you look at it, the more you find that's true. Um, let me just say one more thing and then I'll pass it over. I, uh, um, There's something, um, I, uh, you know, I, I think both of you are getting at this question of well, you know, what is the limit, the point at which this kind of game metaphor no longer captures things and deals with things. And Lindsay's talking about uh, the fact that um, the, the arena of competition of ideas, of truth claims, ultimately has to be an arena of competition amongst individuals you know, pursuing careers and success in that activity. Um, that you have to select people, not just ideas. And I agree. I think one of the important things is that um, even if some people lose, <laughs> the, the, the real key question here is what is the cost of losing and what's the reward of winning? It's not so much uh, that uh, all this competition can be kept in some sort of pure realm of competition of ideas and who's got the best truth claims about reality. Um, it's also that, you know, just as in a game of football, <laughs> you know, if, if, if one team loses, you don't take them out back and shoot them. You know? And if one team wins, you don't give them so much money that they will buy all the players they need and never be beaten again. Right? There's, there's something about, uh, it's, it's true that people are being selected, not just, just ideas. But we still have um, some sort of criteria about uh, what are the limits of winning and losing. And this always reminds me, and this is the last thing I'll say, but uh, uh, is kind of interested in uh, the idea of dignity and respect policies. I won't say why. Um, but, uh, and it's struck me, this is an odd phrase. Most universities and you know, corporations have dignity and respect policies. And I say, but, you know, why not just dignity policies or respect policies? What's the difference between these two terms? And um, <laughs> the, uh, it, to me, the difference is that when we talk about dignity, we're generally talking about a baseline that we think everybody is entitled to. We talk about human dignity. We don't talk about human respect. We talk about human dignity. Um, and uh, so there is some sort of, even in that kind of very general notion, there's some sort of idea of, um, uh, a certain kind of recognition <laughs> that you're entitled to, 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 you know, just as a human being, to be in any game. Uh, but when we start talking about respect, generally you respect people because they've achieved <laughs> things in certain practices. You know, you, you know, that person's a great plumber or a great, you know, a guitarist or a great whatever. Um, and you don't, it's not, it's not reasonable to expect everybody to get equal amounts of respect. It just doesn't work like that. And so there is something in that idea of dignity and respect of a, that we make a distinction between uh, what has to be kind of universal and level, <laughs> to talk about level in the playing field, and where you allow the differences, as in most games, to emerge, and some to uh, gain superior positions because of their performance. Um, and there's, Somewhere in there is the beginnings of how I would try to respond. 
to your uh, penetrating cripple remarks. And I will stop there. <laughs>